Cross Creek has a new sheriff. From the Western Short Stories of R. L. Gardner. Chapter One. Don Jensen was at his desk, catching up on some paperwork. He detested having to fill out papers worse than he did facing a couple of drunken men involved in a brawl. He had decided a few months back that this was going to be his last year as the sheriff of Cross Creek. Ten years of facing life-threatening dangers was long enough. Besides, he was now fifty-six years old, and his body was getting a mite old and creaky. Don could no longer move as fast as he once had, and he knew that his condition could possibly prove to be a problem some day. He was looking forward to the day when all he had to be concerned with was raising a few animals and growing a nice garden. His two children had already matured and moved away from home, and his wife, Sarah, looked forward to his keeping her company all day long. Don was interrupted in his work when a man burst through the front door of the jailhouse and yelled, Sheriff, you better come over to the saloon. There's some men over there trying to beat the hell out of each other, and one of them's threatening to use his gun. Oh, hell, Jasper. Why can't those fools just go somewhere and sleep it off instead of getting so damn cantankerous? Don replied. He strapped on his belt, placed his pistol into the holster, and headed for the Black Bear Saloon, hoping to put an end to the fight without encountering any resistance. As he entered the door of the saloon, he realized that the problem had escalated. Now there were almost a dozen men fighting with each other. Somehow the fools just liked to fight when they were drunk. The sheriff tried hollering as loud as he could to be heard. However, the noise was so loud that no one even heard or saw him. One of the men pulled his pistol and fired wildly at a large man who had just clobbered him. His shot missed the man whom he was aiming for, but instead hit Sheriff Don Jensen in his chest. The fight came to an immediate end. The man who had fired his pistol stood there, looking shocked at what he had just done. One of the other men clobbered him on his head with a full bottle of rot-gut whiskey, dropping him like a shot hog. The bartender took command of the situation, hollering, "'Someone go get the dock, quick! Two of you drag this dumb bastard out of here!' referring to the man who had fired his pistol. Take him over to the jail and make sure that he gets locked up. The doctor's office was only a short distance from the saloon, so he arrived at the saloon in less than two minutes. He inspected the sheriff and shook his head, saying, I'm afraid there's nothing I can do. He's in God's hands now. Some of you help get his body over to the undertaker's office. The deputy arrived at the sheriff's office shortly after the sheriff had left to go to the saloon, unaware of what had just happened. When two men dragged another man to the jail, Deputy Dumas Bigby questioned them. "'What's his problem?' Dumas asked. "'We never had him in here as a drunk before.' "'It's not that, Dumas,' one of the men said. "'This crazy idiot accidentally shot the sheriff in the saloon. He's got to be held here.' "'All right. Uh, put him in the last cell on the right. Uh, I'll lock it,' Dumas replied." Dumas then hurried over to the saloon and learned that the sheriff had died from the shooting. Dumas was flabbergasted, for now there was no sheriff in Cross Creek. He was just a deputy who took orders from the sheriff. He was uneducated and a bit on the slow side, but he knew that the town needed a new sheriff and that he wasn't it. Chapter 2 The town now had a problem. They needed to find a replacement for the deceased sheriff, at least until a permanent sheriff could be found. Mayor Samuel Turpin addressed the half-dozen leading citizens of Cross Creek. Now, you men know, just as well as I do, that if we can't get a new sheriff, some of the men in this town and from the surrounding ranches will declare it open season on starting trouble. I think you're right, Sam, one of the other men agreed. Can Dumas take his place till we get a permanent man? That's a foolish thing to suggest, the mayor responded. As long as Dumas has someone telling him what to do, he's all right as a deputy. But there is no way in hell he can handle a sheriff's job. Now I'm open to suggestions on getting someone else in town to at least take on the job temporarily. Anyone have any ideas? Well, I can't think of a soul in town who could fit the job. Maybe there's a ranch foreman or someone like that who could do it. Uh, they'd be used to bossing people around. Anyone specific that you can think of? The mayor inquired. No one I know of. 
Why should someone give up a good job as a ranch foreman to work at a job where they could get killed? What about Bill Graham? Someone suggested. I understand he's fairly good at shooting a pistol. He goes out varmint hunting all the time. Maybe. But varmints don't shoot back. Bill's great at handling horses at his stable, but I don't know if he can handle men. Besides, he might not want all the trouble that goes with the job. Well, the job's only temporary. We need someone, Mayor Turpin said in exasperation. Ask Bill if he can meet with me. I hate to say it, but he's our best bet for the time being. This is getting to be a joke, Mayor. You can get him if you want to. I'm just not too enthusiastic about the idea, another man piped up. Mayor Samuel Turpin replied angrily, Damn it, Horace, you didn't come up with a name. Now I've had my say, and I'm going to offer Bill the job. Have Bill come to see me as soon as he can. Chapter 3 Bill Graham had just finished pumping fresh water into the trough for a dozen or more horses that he was caring for at his stable. He was getting ready to feed them some hay along with a small ration of oats when he was interrupted by the deputy, Dumas Bigby. Howdy, Bill. The mayor sent me over to ask you to come see him at his office, Dumas called out. What in the world would he want to see me about? Bill inquired. He didn't say. It must be something important, though, Dumas replied. Well, let me finish feeding these horses. It won't take long. Then I'll head over that way, Bill said. I'll help you and walk with you, Dumas said. When all the horses had been tended to, Bill and Dumas walked over to the mayor's office. Dumas left to return to the jail office while Bill climbed the stairs to see the mayor, who also worked as one of the town's two lawyers. The door to Mayor Turpin's office was open, so Bill gave a knock and entered the room. Howdy, Mayor. Did you want to see me about your horse? No, Bill. I'm not worried about my horse. I can depend on you to take good care of him. What I'm worried about is that Cross Creek does not have a sheriff to control things, and, and Dumas really isn't qualified to become a sheriff. I know what you're saying, Mr. Turpin. We all depended on Sheriff Jensen to take care of law and order. I hope you can get us a new sheriff soon, or some of the town's rowdies might see fit to cause us some trouble, Bill responded. You're right about that, Bill. That's what I wanted to talk to you about, Sam Turpin replied. Bill, how would you like to become the sheriff of Cross Creek, at least until we can find a permanent replacement? Me? Why me? I'm just someone who takes care of everyone's horses. You seem like a likable man, and you show a lot of concern about everything that you do, the mayor replied. I've heard that you're good with a pistol. Is that right? Uh, reasonably so, mayor. I like the challenge of getting close to varmints, such as coyotes, and picking them off. It's not a challenge using a rifle on them. Bill, the pay is good. You could save up a good bit of money that way, and well, this isn't a bad town, like some others with a lot of hard cases. Well, mostly drunk and rowdy boys once in a while. It would only be a temporary job. Bill thought about the extra money and made a choice. He said, If I can keep my stable business and hire someone to do the work, I'll take the job. Uh, how do the other people in town feel about me becoming sheriff? Uh, to be truthful, there are a few people who think you're a good man, but that you may not be able to handle the pressure and maintain control. I don't pretend to be as good as Sheriff Jensen was, but I'll do the best I can. When do I start? Mayor Turpin reached into his desk and brought out a badge. I'll swear you in now, and you will then be sheriff. Hold up your right hand and repeat after me. In less than a minute, Bill Graham was the new sheriff of Cross Creek. Chapter 4 It was about fifteen years ago that Will Murcham had been a young man just nineteen years old. Will was fascinated by the exploits of an older ranch hand, Cal Simon, who was very adept at handling a pistol. Cal had once been on the wrong side of the law, and after spending several years in jail had seen the error of his ways, and had decided to go straight. Will spent many hours with Cal, learning how to draw a pistol from a holster and fire it both quickly and accurately. During this time, Cal had repeatedly cautioned Will to never use his pistol unless he absolutely had to in defense. Cal also mentioned to Will that if certain people thought that you were good with a gun, they would seek you out to test how good you really were. As a result, 
Many men had met their fate, either by being outgunned by a challenger or being the one who killed the challenger. Either way, you would be a loser, for if you lived, someone else would be seeking you out. However, Will could never resist the opportunity to exhibit his skills at arranged tournaments where contestants shot at moving targets both for speed and for skill. Gradually, Will improved his skills to the point where he was winning every event. Everything was fine for the next few years. The day came, however, when a newcomer in town noticed how good Will was with his pistol and decided to test him. No one knew that the stranger was actually an outlaw who enjoyed killing men for the thrill of it. The next day, the man confronted Will and asked, "'You think you're hot stuff, don't you, boy?' Will replied, "'I don't know you, mister. I'd just like to go on about my business and hope you might do the same. I've never used my gun in anything but contest and for fun. I've never shot at anyone before, and I don't want to.' The stranger replied, "'Well, now, ain't that just a damn shame. You never killed anyone before, and I've killed eight men.' I'm planning on making that nine, Sonny. This just ain't your lucky day. I'm even going to let you be the one to draw first. That way I won't be in trouble with the law. Look, mister, I don't want to start any trouble. Just leave me alone, Will pleaded. An old friend of Will's whispered to him, Will, just keep your eyes on his gun hand. Don't be distracted by anything else. Think of being in a tournament, and you'll be just fine. Thanks, Tom. I will. Will replied. Draw, boy! Draw! The stranger called out. Will ignored him and kept his eyes on the man's gun hand. Damn you, then! The stranger yelled as he made a move for his gun. Will's gun roared and the stranger yelled. You got me! Damn you! I never even saw you draw! You killed me, boy! He killed me. He sagged to his knees and fell over dead. From that day forward, other potential fast guns shot out Will Merchum to test him. Finally, after ten years, Will could take the pressure no longer and left his job as a ranch hand to move far to the west to set up a new life. He began to grow a mustache and, and changed his name to Bill Graham. After many days on the trail, Bill arrived at the town of Cross Creek. There he met an elderly man who was retiring from the business of operating a stable. Bill bought him out, and for the next five years, operated the town stable. Chapter 5 After being sworn in as the new sheriff of Cross Creek, Bill Graham walked over to the jail to let Dumas Bigby know of his appointment. Bill had always got along well with Dumas and knew that, since Dumas had turned the job down, he would not harbor any resentment towards Bill being his boss. Although Dumas was not sheriff material, he did know a lot about the business. Together, Bill and Dumas went over all the things that a sheriff was expected to do. Since Bill treated Dumas with the respect he deserved, Dumas began acting more like a real deputy sheriff. It made him feel important that he could be of real assistance to the sheriff. Dumas asked Bill, Well, sheriff, I understand that you know how to handle a pistol real good. Are you going to enforce the law by making people see you at work? Sorry to disappoint you, Dumas. And by the way, you don't have to call me sheriff. Bill will do just fine. No, Dumas, I've decided that this will be a lot more effective, he replied as he slipped a shell into each barrel of the shotgun he held in his hands. I've seen what a shotgun can do to a game animal, and it isn't pretty. I don't know of anyone who will face a shotgun, no matter how good he is at pulling a pistol from his holster. I guess you're right there, Bill, Dumas agreed, and I'll expect you to do the same. I sure will, Dumas said as he took the other shotgun down from the rack and admired the weapon. Chapter 6 Before Bill Graham had to begin doing his job, there was the problem of making certain that his stable was going to be taken care of properly. The man who helped the owner of the general store deliver goods to various people around the country and also did other odd jobs was an Indian by the name of Joe Lone Wolf. Bill knew that Joe was really good at handling horses, probably better than anyone besides himself. The owner of the store would have to get himself a new helper if Joe agreed to work for Bill. Joe Lone Wolf had just returned in a wagon to the back of the store and was bringing the horse back to the stable. Howdy, Joe. 
Bill called out to him. That horse is a mite old, but he still is plenty good at pulling a wagon. Buck is a good horse, Sheriff. Will you take good care of him for me? No, Joe, I won't. Joe looked surprised and wondered what he had done to upset Bill. You won't? Why not? Are you mad at me for some reason? Of course not, Joe. I was just wondering if you would take over the business of handling the stable for me, now that I've got sheriff business to be doing. I, I love horses, Bill. I'd love to take care of the stable. Uh, how much money would I get? What do you get now, working as a delivery man? Twenty-five dollars a month, Joe replied. I'll make it forty. You want the job? You bet. I've got to let Mr. Brower know that I'm quitting his business. There are a couple of teen boys who can do the job just as well. Well, tell Mr. Brower, and you can start this afternoon, Joe, Bill said. Now, Bill was ready to start his new job in earnest. Chapter 7 When the town drunk Carl was let out of his cell in the morning, trusting that he would not run off before his trial, all four jail cells were now empty. Bill Graham spent the day going over wanted posters just in case any of those men decided to come to town. He also went over the duties of the sheriff and his deputies written by the town council. He had sent Dumas to check on someone who had killed one of Farmer Jacob's hogs. All in all, it had been a fairly slow day. It was now seven in the evening, and Dumas had returned from his task. It turned out that the hog had broken through the fence wire, had run off into the woods, and a hunter had assumed that he was a wild hog. The hunter paid the farmer five dollars and gave him back half of the hog. Everyone was satisfied that no intentional crime had been committed. Bill enjoyed his two large, fresh biscuits with slices of ham and washed them down with a cup of coffee. He was now ready to make his evening rounds at Cross Creek. Everything seemed peaceful to Bill as he checked every business. Then he heard a fracas coming from the Black Bear Saloon. Whoever had been fighting inside of the saloon had now taken their business out into the street. As Bill approached the crowd of men surrounding the fight, he pointed his shotgun in the air and fired one of its barrels. As he reloaded the empty barrel, the crowd of men stood aside, and the two men doing the brawling stopped long enough to stare at Bill. One of the two men who had been fighting yelled at Bill, "'I was just beginning to whip his ass, and you spoiled my fun. Like hell you was, I was getting the upper hand,' his opponent replied. Like I said, you spoiled my fun, Bill Graham. Now I'm going to have to whip your ass instead. The man approached Bill with the intent of brawling with him. Bill faced a choice of either shooting the man or fighting with him. He didn't either, for as the man started to swing his fist at him, Bill simply smashed the butt of his shotgun into the man's forehead, dropping him like a sack of feed. Looking at the other fighter, Bill asked him, You want the same or do you want the other end of this gun? The man made no reply. All right, then. You march on over to the jail. Two of you drag this guy's carcass over to the jail. Both of them are going to spend a couple of days as guests of Cross Creek's finest hotel. Now move. As the crowd of men broke up and went back to their saloons or elsewhere, Bill heard a few of them muttering, Damn, well, I guess the new sheriff means business. Chapter 8 Bill looked up from his desk to see Mayor Turpin entering his office. Howdy, Mayor. What brings you down this way? Well, Sheriff, as you know, there's been some cattle rustling going on in the county. A number of our cattlemen have complained. Each one of them have only missed a few cattle here and there. But if you add up all of the cattle that have gone missing, it would amount to quite a few beef. I know, Mayor. This has been going on for quite a few months now. Our former sheriff never did find out who was doing the stealing. My guess is that you came here to get me to do something about it, right? You nailed it, Sheriff. I don't know how you're going to locate these thieves, but we do need to try our best. Keep me informed and let me know if you need any assistance, the mayor replied. I'll do my best, Mayor. Bill sat thinking about the situation. The cattle still had to be hidden somewhere, for there had not been any drives in the area lately, which would have given away the stolen cattle. Somewhere, out in the surrounding territory, there was a herd of cattle, but he was not familiar with much of the wild country out there. Then an idea struck him. Bill went down to his stable business and spoke to Joe Lone Wolf. 
Joe, I know that you're good with handling horses, and I appreciate what you've done so far. I need to ask you a question, though. What's that, Bill? You are probably familiar with most of the area around here, aren't you? Bill asked. Yes, better than most folks. Why do you ask? You can track animals good, too, right? Right. Again, why do you ask? I need your help in finding where all of the stolen cattle could be hidden away, Joe. The mayor may pay you for your help. I need for you to ride with me and help me find where the cattle could be hidden. I'll be glad to, Bill, especially since I'm going to get paid. I know someone who will take care of the horses for a few days, and the mayor can pay him, too. When will you be ready to go? I'll get the boy to work here and be right with you, Joe replied. About an hour later, Joe showed up at the jailhouse and said, I'm ready to ride, Bill. Let's get started. We'll need enough supplies for a few days. I've already loaded a pack horse, so it's already taken care of. Good thinking, Joe. I'll be taking a rifle with me. I hope that I don't have to use it, but you never know. Which way are we headed? North. That's where the hills start, and that's where there are some canyons which are ideal to hike cattle in. I know them all. Let's go. The first day out, Bill and Joe rode into the hills, and after scouting about for a long while, saw no cattle. Bill decided that he wanted to come hunting here next fall, for there were quite a few mule deer in the hills. The next day, Joe held up his hand and signaled for Bill to remain quiet. Then Bill heard some cattle lowing in the distance. They proceeded more slowly on horseback until the sounds became louder. They tied up their horses and proceeded on foot, climbing up the slope of a hill until they looked down on the valley below them. There were the cattle. Bill looked through his binoculars, being careful to keep in the shade to avoid the sun's rays, and noticed there were different brands on many of the cattle. They had to be the stolen cattle. Bill then spotted a crude shelter at the base of the slope on the opposite side of the canyon. He let Joe look through the binoculars and said, The rustlers have to be holed up in there. As Joe viewed the shelter, three men emerged from it to relieve themselves against a few trees. They then re-entered the shelter. Joe mentioned for Bill to follow him down a side ridge where they could remain out of sight of the shelter. Bill agreed, for they would then be able to approach the men unseen. When Bill and Joe were fairly close to the shelter, Bill stooped and picked up a fist-sized rock. He hurled it against the side of the shelter and hollered, This is the sheriff. You're surrounded by five men armed with shotguns. Either you come out of there with no weapons in your hands, or we're going to bust your little house down and blow you apart with buckshot. It's your choice. You've got just three seconds to come out. The three rustlers were thieves, but they were not killers. They meekly emerged from the shelter. Joe tied leather lacings around the men's hands behind their backs. Bill then had Joe round up the men's horses and assist the men onto their horses. They then rode back to Cross Creek, where the men were placed in cells. Bill then went over to the mayor's office and said, "'We got the thieves, Mr. Turpin. You can let the ranchers know where the cattle are. Joe can show them the way.' "'Did you have any trouble with the men? Was there any shooting?' the mayor inquired. "'No trouble at all. If it wasn't for Joe helping me, I would never have found them. I think a nice reward should be given by the ranchers to Joe. It's better than having the town pay him, don't you agree? I'll talk to them. I'm sure they can come up with something,' the mayor replied. A few days later, Joe was wealthier by over two hundred dollars. Chapter 9 Bill Graham stopped in at the general store to buy some ammunition for his pistol and shotgun. It was at the expense of the town of Cross Creek, since he was the sheriff. There he met the schoolteacher, Miss Jennifer Goodwin, a pleasant young woman who had several years of college education. Bill had always liked Jennifer, but had never thought of her as being more than just a friend. While Bill was very outgoing with the men of the community, he was like a bashful kid when it came to associating with girls. Jennifer had noticed this and decided that one day she would just have to be the first one to make their friendship more than just what it had been. "'Good morning, Miss Jennifer,' Bill said. Uh, "'How are things going at the schoolhouse?' Jennifer knew that would be the extent of Bill's conversation, but she had a more important subject on her mind at the time. It concerned one of her students, a boy of about eight years of age, who apparently had problems at home. 
Sheriff, I, I mean Bill, I need your help, Jennifer said with a concerned expression. Uh, yes, Miss Jennifer, what can I do for you? Bill asked. Well, for one thing, quit saying Miss before my name. <laughs> There's a little boy in my class who appears to have been badly mistreated by his parents. Yesterday he came to school with a blackened eye and bruises on his face and welts on his back. As a woman, there's nothing I can do. I need for you to see what's happening at his home. I'm a firm believer in spanking their little butts when they misbehave, but I can't stand the thought of an adult beating a child. Will you check on him for me? I sure will, Jennifer. Just let me know who he is and where he lives, and I'll check on him. Jennifer told him the boy's name and where he lived. Bill said, I'm going out there right now, Jennifer. I'll let you know what I find out and what I can do to help. As Bill approached the weather-beaten shack, he heard a man bellowing in anger and children crying in fear. He knocked on the door and all of the commotion ceased. A scrawny, haggard woman opened the door a crack and asked what Bill wanted. I'm Sheriff Graham, ma'am. I'm here to check on a complaint. Now, open the door, or I'll open it for you. As the woman reluctantly opened the door, Bill noticed that she was sporting a blackened eye and a bruise on her cheek. Entering the room, Bill noticed a large, drunken man, Max Seth, setting a leather strap down on the bed. Two young boys were lying face down on the bed with their pants pulled down below their exposed buttocks. Apparently, Mac was just about to begin beating the boys. Max Seth roared out, "'This is private business, Sheriff!' You got no business coming into my home. Now get the hell back out that door and don't come back or I'll give you a good working over. You threatening the county sheriff, mister? It's not just a threat, sheriff. It's a promise. As Bill pointed the barrels of his shotgun at Mac, he said, I don't think that would be a good idea. Now either you can come out of the house or you can try your luck at attacking me. It's your choice, mister. I ain't arguing with no shotgun. I'll come outside. You'd better be lucky you got that gun with you because he just saved your sorry ass, the drunken Mac sneered. Once outside, Bill laid the shotgun to one side and said, Well, now you can make good on your promise. Try your luck now. Mac laughed and said, You just made one big mistake, Sheriff. Now you're gonna get it. Bill easily ducked the swinging right fist of Max and delivered a hard blow to his stomach. Mac flinched in pain but continued to come forward. He swung his fist again at Bill but had the blow blocked by Bill's defensive arm. Bill hit Mac hard just behind his left ear. Mac collapsed to the ground, stunned and senseless. The woman complained. You didn't have to hit him that hard. Maybe he will know how women and children feel when they get hit by a brute like him, Bill answered. Hitch a horse to that wagon, and we'll tie him up and throw him in it. He's going to jail. Maybe I'll put him in a cell with Barney. Big Barney may decide to work him over when I let him know how he beats up little children. On the way back to jail, Bill drove the wagon. Max started moving about. He decided to roll out of the wagon and escape without Bill noticing him, since his back was turned to him. Mac pushed against the side of the wagon and fell partially out of the back of the wagon. However, his pants leg got caught on a protruding nail and his head hit the ground over and over again. Bill heard the screams and stopped the wagon. He went back to check on Mac. He was too late, for Mac had died of a broken neck. Bill hauled his body back onto the wagon and continued on into town to see the undertaker. Back in town, Bill had Dumas go back to the house and inform Mac's wife that he had tried escaping and had died in an accident. He also asked Dumas to let the wife know that he would ask the mayor to try to find a job for the woman to work at to help support her children. Bill then located Jennifer and told her the entire story. I'm sorry that he died, Jennifer, but it was his own doing. I didn't want him dead. That was not any of our doing, she replied. Maybe we can talk some more about this later, uh, since I've got some preparation to do for tomorrow's class. I'd uh, like that very much, Jennifer, Bill replied. Then he thought to himself, Jennifer is not what you would call a beautiful woman, but she is nice-looking. 
She's educated and real smart. I hope she doesn't look down on me for not being educated. Meanwhile, Jennifer was thinking, Well, Bill is older than me, but I like him a lot. I hope he doesn't think I'm just a prudish school teacher. Chapter 10 As Bill made his rounds, checking on how everything was going in Cross Creek, he was greeted by the town citizens whom he passed by. Some of them had doubts when Bill was first hired as the sheriff. He had now proven himself to be able to handle just about any situation that arose, and most of the people had come to accept him as their new sheriff. It appeared that his job may not be temporary any longer. At least he hoped not. His agreement had been to work for about six months or longer, if a new sheriff could not be found. As he walked along the boardwalk, a stranger rode by him on the way to the Black Bear Saloon. Looking at the man from behind, there was something about the man that reminded Bill of someone he had known in his past. However, he could not place where it had been or who the man was. He didn't think about the matter any more as he stopped to talk with a couple of the ladies on the sidewalk. Later that afternoon, as Bill was cleaning his pistol, it finally occurred to him where he had seen the stranger before. It was in his past, in the community he had lived in before coming to Cross Creek. The stranger was Ron Baggett, better known as Ruthless Ron Baggett, a cold-blooded killer who was wanted by the law back east. Bill checked his wanted posters, but could not find one on Ron. Until Ron committed a crime of some sort, there was absolutely nothing Bill could do. He figured it would only be a matter of time before Ron saw him. Either Ron would try to kill him, or he would expose him to the people of Cross Creek that their sheriff was nothing more than a gunslinger who had killed people. Either way, the thought worried Bill. Even if Ron did not expose him and he managed to kill Ron in a gunfight, the people would see for themselves how he handled a gun and know the truth. Either way, he figured his days as the sheriff of Cross Creek would not last much longer. Bill said to Dumas, Dumas, there's a stranger in town who's a real fast-draw killer. His name is Ron Baggett, and he's very, very fast with his gun draw. Do not ever let him egg you on to draw on him. If you do, you'll be dead. Do you understand? Do you know who he is? He's from back east. He kills for the sheer enjoyment of it. Stay out of his way. I'll remember, and I'll always carry the shotgun with me. Good. I don't want you dead. Several days later, Bill was making the rounds of the town when he came face to face with Ron Baggett. Ron stared at Bill for a minute before a wide grin appeared on his face. Well, I'll be damned. You're Will Merchum, aren't you? Ron asked. No, my name is Bill Graham, Bill replied. <laughs> it may be Bill Graham now, but back east it was Will Merchum. Even with your mustache, I'd still know who you are, <laughs> Ron laughed. I'm making a new life for myself now. You tend to your business, and I'll tend to mine. You're not wanted here, but so long as you don't cause any trouble in Cross Creek, you can go on about your business, Bill replied. I noticed your badge, a sheriff's badge, <laughs> Ron said and laughed. Do the good citizens of this hick town know that you used to be a fast-draw artist who's killed a few people? I'm good on the draw myself, Sheriff. I guess that makes us both the same kind of people. No, it doesn't. I killed because I was challenged, and I never drew my gun first. I always killed in self-defense. However, you killed because you enjoyed killing. You're right on one thing, Sheriff. I do enjoy killing. And you'd better not be without that shotgun, because one day I'm going to enjoy killing you. <laughs> Ruthless Ron laughed as he walked down the sidewalk, even tipping his hat to a lady walking by. Ron gave some thought about gunning down Bill Graham in a gunfight. As long as Bill carried that shotgun with him, his chances were not good. For if there was just one thing Ron feared, it was being cut in two by a blast from a shotgun. He had already made acquaintances with a couple of the town's undesirable citizens and decided to enlist the aid of one of them to make matters better in dealing with Bill. He was willing to give the man ten dollars just to do him one little favor. And ten dollars could buy a lot of drinks, 
and even have enough left over for a fling with one of the town's soiled doves. Later, a man burst into Bill's jail office and hollered out, Sheriff, there's a couple of men trying to kill each other at the saloon. Come quick. Bill picked up a shotgun and followed the man back to the saloon. Earlier, Ron Baggett had offered to buy drinks for two men if they would pretend to be wrestling with each other. When the sheriff showed up, they could stop. The men agreed. As Bill entered the saloon, the men stopped their scuffle and told the sheriff they were just having fun. As Bill was scolding them, the man who had come to fetch him grabbed his shotgun away from him and threw it over the bar counter. He then ran out of the saloon. Bill was angry and yelled, What in the hell is going on in here? <laughs> Just evening the odds in my favor, Will. <laughs> Ron laughed as he emerged from behind some other men. You made me nervous carrying that shotgun around. They scare me. <laughs> However, Will, you don't scare me. Why are you calling the sheriff Will? His name is Bill, one of the men yelled out to Ron. Well, to you men, his name might be Bill. I've always known him as Will Merchum, fast gun artist. Guy responsible for the deaths of several men who weren't that good with a pistol. There were murmurs throughout the saloon. Bill knew that his days as a sheriff were coming to an end, one way or another. Bill knew that there was no way out except to accept Ron's challenge. He said to Ron, There are a lot of good men in here who might get hurt when bullets start to fly. Why don't we step outside? Ron replied, Well, you're right there. I don't have any hard feelings towards any of these men, and I'd hate to see your stray bullet harm any of them. <laughs> Let's go outside. Uh, bartender, you're going to be the one to count from one to three. On the count of three, we both draw. If either of us cheats, the rest of you men can gun down the cheat. Is that fair with you, Will? Let's step outside. As soon as I finish my drink. <laughs> you men, I'm buying drinks when I come back in. The men waited on the boardwalk as Bill walked out into the street and waited for ruthless Ron Baggett to finish his drink. While waiting for Ron, Bill addressed the crowd waiting to see who would come out victorious. Some of them were even making bets on the outcome. Folks, yes, my name used to be Will Merchum, and yes, I used to compete in contests seeing who could draw his pistol the fastest and shoot the most accurate. Yes, there were men who for any damn reason would come by to see if they were faster on the draw. I tried talking the fools out of challenging me. Sometimes they listened. Other times they were too damn fired up on proving how good they were. Let me tell all of you this. I never once challenged another man. I never once drew my pistol first or in anger. My mistake in life was that as a young kid I thought it would be fun to draw and shoot fast. If I had to do it over again, I would never have touched a pistol. I guess that's all I have to say for now. <laughs> Enough talking. <laughs> Damn, that was a real good speech, Will. Why, you should have been a politician. But it's too late now. Bartender... When you're ready, you start counting from one to three. On the count of three, we both draw. And may the best man win. Oh, of course, <laughs> that'll be me. <laughs> Ron laughed again. The bartender started counting. Bill never took his eyes off of Ron's right hand. On the count of three, both men instantly drew their pistols. As Ron's pistol just began clearing its holster, Bill's gun roared twice both bullets smashing into Ron's chest. As Ron dropped to his knees, he cried out, Damn, you're fast. He fell forward face first into a pile of horse apples. He thought nothing of it, being that he was dead before he hit the ground. Bill addressed the crowd again, saying, Well, I guess you'll be wanting me to turn in my badge, now that you know about my past. I'll be moving on, and I hope that no one else will come looking for me again to see how good they are. Bill was shocked when he heard the cries from the men and women surrounding him. Hell no, you ain't going anywhere. We know that we got us one damn good sheriff now. Bill, take the day off. We'll take care of this worthless trash littering our streets. What about the mayor and the other men? Bill inquired. 
They know who elected them, and they'll do what we say, <laughs> one of the men answered. Okay, then, Bill replied. There is someone I need to have a conversation with. I hope that her answer will be yes. He headed down the street toward the schoolhouse. Mm -hmm.